So I love this story. Um, this is called um, The Chinese Remainder Theorem. Um, so there was this book, and I can't pronounce it perfectly, but it's something like Sun Tzu Xuan Qing, something like that. Um, but it translates in English as Master Sun's Mathematical Manual. And there are like 10 of these books that were like considered like this amazing mathematical canon. And these are like really, really old. So this is from like like 5th um, or 3rd century, 3rd to 5th century. And um, the actual author of this particular theorem um, is um, Master Sun, I guess, himself. So um, I guess that's the most we know about that particular person. Um, but this was this um, theorem. And all the time in math, you're always like looking at something and going, this is super obscure. When are we ever going to need this? And this is a wonderful thing because if someone asked this question like 1,800 years ago, you could be like, well, like almost 2,000 years from now, we're going to use it in RSA encryption. It's going to be super cool. And they'd be like, all right, that's good enough for me. Okay, so let's talk about what this actual theorem is. Okay, <laughs> so, and I say this in, in all love of this um, theorem, but whenever would your brain be like, this is one day going to be useful information. Okay, so if P and Q are co-prime, then if X is congruent to Y modulo P and X is congruent to Y modulo Q, then X is congruent to Y modulo the product of P and Q. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to know. I can't tell you how many times this has come up in casual conversation. Ah! Okay, so first of all, let's make sure you know what coprime means. So coprime means it has no common factors. So like 12 and 25, you know how you did that thing in like grade school where you're like, this is a 2 and a 6, and this is a 2 and a 3, and this is a 5 and a 5. So the prime factorization is 2, 2 squared 3 and 5 squared. So they have no common factors. Their greatest common divisor is 1. We were doing that. That was like a long time ago. Um... So like if you have like numbers 12 and 15, you'd be like 2 and 6, so 2 and 3, and then 2 and, nope, <laughs> I can't math. Um, so this would be 2 squared 3, and this would be 3 times 5. So they have a greatest common divisor of 3. Do you remember doing this? They have, both have a 3 kind of thing. Okay, so um, GCD of 1 means coprime. <laughs> GCD that's not one is not coprime. Yay, coprimimity. All right, so back to what this was saying. So if P and Q are coprime, then if we have two numbers that are congruent to each other mod P and also congruent to each other mod Q, then they're congruent to each other mod P, Q. That's super exciting, isn't it? So since we know that um, 12 and 25 are coprime, let's let P can be equal to 12 and Q can be equal to 25. All right, so um, let's do 301. These are in no way random numbers. I had to spend some time making sure I got good ones. So 301 is congruent to one modulo 12. Okay, and if you wanna think about this in the like computer science -y way of writing it, we could say 301 mod 12 is equal to 1. So if I took 301 and I divided it by 12, I would have like, oh, some kind of a number, 5, 60, so remainder 1. So 301 divided by 12 has a remainder of 1. So 301 is congruent to 1 mod 12, and 301 is congruent to 1 also modulo 25. Right, that one should be a little bit more obvious, right, because you... 25 is, goes up to 100, but um, so 301 mod 25 is equal to 1. But I'll go ahead and work it out. So 301 divided by 25, and then that's 51, and that gives me a 2, so that's 50, so remainder 1. So they both have a remainder of 1. They're both congruent to 1, or they're both congruent to each other. 301 and 1 are congruent to each other mod 25. So since we have that, that must mean, so that means that 301 is congruent to 1 modulo whatever 12 times 25 is, 300. Okay, and that one should be super obvious, right? Because 301 divided by 300 is 1 with a remainder of 1. Yay! Okay, so um, 
not shocking. <laughs> I mean, okay, it, this is not shocking. The fact that these have anything to do with each other, however, I feel like is shocking. So just to show you how this fails, if we do this with stuff that's not coprime, so like we said that P was equal to um, 12, and like let's say that Q is equal to 15. Um, so I could say, well, 61 is congruent to 1 mod 12, or that, you know, 61 mod 12 is equal to 1. So if I take 61, divide it into 12, I've got 5, 60, and 1, remainder 1, okay? And then 61 is also congruent to 1 mod 15. So 61 mod 15 is equal to 1. So again, 61 divided by 15, that's 4, 60, and a 1. All right, so they're both remainder 1, yay. So then in theory, so the question is, is 61 congruent to 1 modulo 12 times 15, um, which is 180? And the answer is like, like no, <laughs> it's just not. Um, if I do 61 divided by 180, I don't get a remainder of one, I get a remainder of 61. 61 is congruent to 61 <laughs> mod 180. So I could say that one is congruent to 181 mod modulo 180. Um, but definitely 1 and 61 in modulo 180 are not congruent. So I cannot imagine a life 1,700 years ago where this would be a relevant fact, but that's what makes it so amazing is they were just like doing math just for the pure and unadulterated love of it, I suppose. So let's give them some emotional like backwards in time love and do a quick proof and uh, let's call it a quick proof, but let's do a proof and, and make sure that we can follow how this all works. Okay, so we're going to start with, um, we're kind of going to do this in, in two different parts. It's not going to be quite as pretty as the if and only if, if and only if, if and only if, but we'll almost get there. So um, let's go that. Um, X is congruent to Y modulo P if and only if there exists a k in the set of integers such that um, x is equal to kp plus y. And we've kind of talked about how to set those up before. Um, that just means that they are a, um, a, a difference, uh, an integral difference of each other. And in fact, we also said that we can just actually write it as x minus y is equal to um, kp. So I just moved the y to the other side. So um, we can do this. And I guess we'll put in an and. <laughs> and so uh, x is congruent to y mod q, modulus q, means that there exists some, I should call it L, in the set of integers such that, such that x minus y is equal to L q. All right, so that's the same thing. I just wrote it um, for each of those. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is the fact that L and Q have a GCD of 1. Sorry, not L and Q, that P and Q have a GCD of 1. All right, now I kind of hate to admit defeat here, but I can't super duper prove the next step without getting into like a whole bunch of like, I don't know what you call it, um, I guess just algebraic theorems like like the pure math stuff when you like are proving why a times zero equals zero and why a times one equals a um, and all these weird kind of obscure GCD proofs. But I think a talkie proof um, will be good enough for what we're trying to do. So basically what we're saying here is that P divides um, X minus Y, right? P perfectly divides X minus Y and Q perfectly divides um, X minus Y as well. So since P and Q don't share any common factors, 
pq then must also divide x minus y. And I feel like there should be like a really easy way to show this, um, but I just can't come up with it. So it's kind of like with the, the 12 and the 25. So, um, you know, if, if, if 12 perfectly divides, um, I don't know, like, like, let me try this again. So like, if I had 600, um, P at, let's say the 600 is divided perfectly by 12, and 600 is divided perfectly by 25, um, since these guys don't share any common factors, then that means also that um, their product, which is 300, would also need to um, divide um, <laughs> divide 600. I guess I'm not really sure how to um, <laughs> how to say this any better, except uh, if you just kind of talk it through, it kind of makes sense. All right, so I can do better than just look at it. It makes sense, I swear. Let's try it some other kind of ways. So like, okay, I like this idea. Let's see. Let's kind of see what we got right here. Let's say that we had a number like 600. All right, so 600, if I divide it by 12, I can think about that as being 50 times 12 divided by 12, all right? And then 600 divided by 25. Well, I could also think about that as being um, 24 times 25 divided by 25. Right, so they're they're equally divisible. So basically, this is an integer, and um, this is an integer. Now, what's happening is if I was looking at the prime factorization of six hundred, I would basically have, um, I guess, two squared times three, which would be twelve, and then I would have a five squared, which would be the twenty-five, um, and then, gosh, what else would I have in there? I guess just another. Two in this case. Um, but since, how shall I say it? Since this 12 perfectly divides 600 and this perfectly divides 600, um, then if I'm trying to divide 600 by their, um, by their product, then basically all I'm doing is I'm putting these together and they act in concert to perfectly divide 600. Now that's not what we would get if those two weren't co-primes. So again, back to our examples, which were 12 and 15. So if I had 600 divided by 12, again, that would be 50 times 12 over 12, and 600 divided by 15, which would give us like 40 times 15 over 15. Now the problem is, um, it is not true that 600 is equal to um, like the 12, which would be 2 squared 3, and then the 15 would be 3 squared 5, because that, and then, you know, times some other number, because that 3 here is being shared by, um, by both of those terms. So in the process of sharing those terms, um, like here, it was because all those terms were unique that it ended up being just this perfect multiple of those two numbers together. But because those two numbers are shared, if I actually try and go and do this, so I'd have like four times three times three times five, so that ought to be 180. So 600 divided by 180, this here term would have to be 10 thirds because there's this extra stupid three because these two have a three in common. Okay, and I feel like there should be a really easy way to prove that using math and I can't figure it out, but one day I will, or maybe um, one of y'all people watching this will find it and send me to this great link that'll be super cool that doesn't involve having to learn another like five theorems to prove it. But for the moment, hopefully a proof by example is enough besides the other proof by example. Um, but the thing is, like most of the explanations, they just show up and they say, since P and Q share no common factors, then PQ must also divide XY. And they just say it like it's super obvious. And I don't know why it's not super obvious to me. Um, 
you know, just I don't have an answer for why it's not super obvious to me, but I can demonstrate it. I just don't know how to actually prove it. And and I guess my problem with a lot of these proofs in general is I've had to hunt for hours and hours and actually years for some of these proofs because people will just be like, clearly, blah, blah, blah. And everybody knows that clearly is professor code for I don't actually know what I'm doing, so please don't ask. So I'm convinced that nobody else knows. No, okay, I know clearly other people know how to do this, but I'm convinced that most people who act like they know how to do it totally don't act actually know how to do it. But anyway, the plan is, is that since P and Q don't share any common factors, then PQ also has to perfectly divide X minus Y. That means that there has to exist some kind of other integer, like we might call M, in the set of integers such that um, X minus Y is a multiple of PQ. Um, and since we can say that, that's true if and only if um, x is congruent to y um, mod pq. And that's kind of our little QED. Except this is like a sad QED, so I'm going to put like a little, like, oh, I don't want to get something sticking out of his mouth. He's a sad QED because, like, it's kind of a QED, but it's not perfect. So my goal in life is, one of my goals in life is to get through this, um, uh, what is it called? The Potashnik book, the Graham Knuth Potashnik Concrete Mathematics. That's one of my mathematical goals in life. But another goal is to have a better way to explain this besides, look, I swear it works. Um, but anyway, the Chinese remainder theorem, definitely, definitely useful. And we're going to use it at some point when we're playing around with RSA encryption.